send, uh, not last, I mean from last Tuesday to, to uh, when it's Sunday and Tuesday, because what happened is last week I hit a nerve. I knew when I hit a nerve, it's time to keep drilling. And uh, it's, it was funny because, you know, when that, you know, as I do when the dentist is working in your mouth and he hits it, you, you know it. And as, a, as a, a pastor for over 20 years now, when I hit a nerve, I know it. And uh, it did with this. It, it affects me, too. Marley, I'm glad you said what you said, because we don't always know what people are going through when they act out, particularly kids. And, uh, uh, you know, and also being a parent, you've got to look at why kids do maybe say the way things they do and use more wisdom on how to handle them. It doesn't mean they don't need a good whooping, you know. You still can't, you still can't use what's happened in your life and past as a crutch to always act out. Eventually, you've got to grow up and, and make a change for yourself. But the title of our thought here is that your tongue control it. It is your tongue, you know, and, and what you speak about, you can bring about, period. If you, if you speak that uh, you, you're poor, guess what? You're always going to be poor. If you speak about uh, y- your life is no good and you never found a good uh, uh, spouse, you're never going to find a good spouse. You've got to start loving yourself. You've got to start talking a little bit better. So what you talk about, what you speak about, you can bring about in your life. Even poor health, it's amazing how we affect the way our health is by always kind of hypochondriac and everything, you know, because somebody else has got a sickness. We're waiting on our sickness to come in. And, you know, I... I, I want to believe that eventually you can die healthy. And I, I, I say that because the body does wear out. Eventually, it, it will wear out. The earth suit that we're in now, it just deteriorates. And it's a tent, as you know. And I remember when, I, when the man I, I called my grandpa died, I asked my dad. I remember it was one of them odd things. And if you've ever been to where I'm from in North Alabama, up there, on, on, there was a little log cabin down in front of us. And uh, we lived up here on the side of the hill. And my granny lived here in this little log cabin. And I saw an ambulance come out, and I'd never seen an ambulance. I'd never seen, you know, you're out there on the mountain. It's not a common sight. And I saw an ambulance pull up, and I asked my mom. I said, where's, where's Dad? And he, he said he's down taking care of uh, Grandpa. And I said, what happened? And she said, Grandpa just died. And, you know, and you're trying to, as a kid, you're trying to figure out what, what does that mean, just died. That, does, that means you no longer get to go down there and hang out with him. And I said, why, how'd he die? And my mom said, he was old. And that was it. And no, no autopsy, nothing else. He just died. He lived his life. He chewed bull of the woods. You know, he was, a, he was a great old man. I never remember him without his overalls on. You know, there's a, that's a generation, by the way, that's passing away. We're going to miss this overall generation. We got a man that comes out, works at the ranch all the time. It's not, I call him Bobby Earl. Uh, I don't even remember his uh, Bobby Roberts. He's a man got two same, his, his name is the same name. Either way, you flip it, Robert, Bobby, Bobby Robert. And, uh, but I call him Bobby Earl, and he always wear these uh, Carhartt uh, overalls. And they're, I mean, it'd be 100 degrees outside. He got them Carhartt overalls on. And I'm thinking there's coming a day when that generation will pass. You know, I, I think sometimes we ought to shoot fire, go get us some overalls, guys, and pull them back out again, have us a Sunday of overalls, you know. You know, try that. I think maybe during the conference we'll, we'll throw down tonight and have an overall night. How about that? Yeah. Ronnie, you got no pair of overalls? You got to go get some. Some big, you got to get some big boy overalls. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So the tongue, we've been talking about how the ways that the tongue can bring about uh, benefit to others. And we'll walk through this real quick, and then we'll get to our message tonight. First, wise counsel and sound advice. Your tongue is good for wise counsel and sound advice. Maybe not your tongue, but that tongue is out there somewhere. Proverbs 15, 22, without consultation, plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they succeed. I ask you all, do not make a major decision under pressure. And do not make major decisions without consultation. Make sure somebody's around you. I don't care if it's buying a car, a house, getting married. Uh, whatever you plan on doing in life, have some consultation. Have somebody that loves you enough to see your blind spots and check those things out with you. And, you know, and I've said it before, it's hard to measure the benefits of good counsel, but one can look at the carnage of a life lived with no or bad counsel. It's evident. You can see people's lives that are just falling apart. Things that, why? They never got counsel. They just did their own thing. There's a problem with doing your own thing. Amen. Now, you know, if you don't learn from somebody else's experience in life, then, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to call you stupid, but it's not smart. 
you know, learn from somebody else's experience. Learn from what they say. That's why them overalls are important, because to me they speak of wisdom, that you can get back around them and hang out with them. Another way the tongue is good to, for others is reproof, rebuke, spiritual exhortation. And I know them three, they don't look like they go together. Reproof, rebuke, and spiritual exhortation. Guys, until I understood the Word of God, I didn't understand rebuke. You know, I would be gotten on to when I was young. But now that I understand the, the, the Bible, there was times that Paul rebuked Peter for acting all uh, showy around the Gentiles because he was acting all Jewish. And Paul chewed him out one time, rebuked him. You see it in the book of Acts. There's times even brothers have to say something to one another or father figures, mother figures to others. But there's a need for reproof and rebuking. And the Bible is that book that we can use. You can't stand on your own stuff, but you can say, thus saith the Bible. The word of the Lord says this in your life, you know. And so if you'll do this, I guarantee you it will help you out. Proverbs 15 31 says, he who listens to a life-given rebuke will be at home among the wise. He who ignores discipline despises himself, but whoever heeds correction gains understanding. How rare yet how essential reproof is. It makes us a better person. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. I had a, a, a missionary come and hang out with me today. He came up, he's from Ecuador, and uh, he was in the neighborhood at a conference over in Louisiana, and he came through and took him out for lunch and spent a little time talking with him. And, and I realized after just talking with him a little while how important it is that, let me say it like this, it's okay to be wounded by a friend. And, and the issue with a friend is this. If you love somebody and you rebuke them, you don't enjoy the rebuke. You don't enjoy getting on to somebody, you know, because you love them. If you have any enjoyment at all in chewing on somebody for doing wrong, then you're wrong. You shouldn't like it. You know, and I do remember my dad saying, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. There were times my dad needed to correct me when I was young. And I think we've got away from some of that. We're scared. We're scared to deal with our kids properly. But I stood up in the back of a 49 Ford truck by the urging of my cousin, Tony, who always got me in trouble. <laughs> you got a cousin like that in your life? Tony was my cousin. Man, I'm telling you what, this man got me in trouble. He talked me into leaving a cotton field one time. I was picking cotton, and he said, let's go home. And uh, I was probably six, seven years old, and, and uh, they gave me my money for a morning's work, and I, I kept it in my hand. By the time we cut through a briar patch to get back to the house, I lost all my money. I had no money to show for a half a day's work. My dad got home. He whooped me. I stood in the back of that truck, and there was Tony again. He said to me, he said, I bet you won't walk to the back of the tailgate and come back. And I remember I got up with the dare, walked to the tailgate, which was three or four steps. When I turned around, I saw my dad's eyes in the rearview mirror. There ain't nothing like eyes like that. <laughs> His eyes caught my eyes, and I knew at that moment I was in trouble. I didn't wait to get back to the front of the truck, sit down. I went down right then. Knees wilted under me. When I got to the house, my dad took me by the hand and brought me out to a place we called the Muscadine Vines, which was out behind, I know this sounds old-fashioned, guys, but out behind the outhouse, he took me far enough, when, and I couldn't figure out why dad was taking me so far out in the woods, and the reason was so my mom couldn't hear it. And he took a belt to me, and he said to me, and I, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. He lied. <laughs> there ain't no way what he did to me hurt him worse than it hurt me. Because he whooped the tar out of me. Again, can I tell you something? I, I never stood up in back of trucks in. That was a reproof, a rebuke, and correction along with it. And discipline that I needed. Because many times when we're young, and it's hard to deal that out. I know when we're younger, well, as young parents and things of that nature. And, but, but there's a time in our life where we have to figure out how to discipline, how to help somebody. Because the end thereof, if they're not corrected, is death. They'll die. You know, something will happen in their life. So faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's very important to, to take a moment sometimes to look at a friend's life and say, you know, I love you so much, but i got to share this with you, man. you got to be careful here in this area. And much of this has to do with discernment and discretion. There's a right way and a right time, not to mention the right motive. It's got to be, timing's got to be right. Amen. Motive has to be right. Why are you doing this? Why are you saying this to me? Uh, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver, like an earring in the, of, of gold or an ornament of fine gold as a wise man's rebuke to a listening ear. There's nothing wrong with getting somebody saying to you, that's going to get you in trouble. That's going to get you hurt. That's, that's going to destroy your life. You, we need people like that in our life. Amen. Amen. Now, on the flip side, we don't always go around hunting for people's stuff to, to look at. Because if you're looking hard enough, long enough, you're going to find something. 
Amen. Because all of us got stuff that, that needs dealing with. So give folk time to deal with their own stuff before you go nosing up in there. And then learn how to give a word of encouragement. Oh, oh, I love this, man. A man finds joy in giving an out reply. And how good is a timely word? Just that right word. You know, you know I flew up, uh, Sister Lori and I did up to Oklahoma City and spent some time with some pastor friends of ours. And this pastor looked at me and I, I said something to him and he gave me one word, one word. And I said to myself, it was worth the trip, the money to get here, and everything we did to get here for that one word. Because that word actually affects our whole conference. It was the word I was looking for. The man looked at me when I told him all the things that are going on in my life. You know what he said? He said, Pastor, it sounds like to me you need to reboot. I said, that the word right there. We're going to reboot. Amen. We're starting all over again, again. Twelve years as a church, it stands for government, amen, and we're going to get this thing in order. Can I get an amen? amen? So, I mean, I got back and I started rebooting. I started doing things that were a little bit different. Matter of fact, rebooting was already going on in our lives. you got to look for teachable moments and things, and time and again is very important. In the tongue, we talked about Sunday as a damaging sword. Woo! Your tongue, your tongue, your tongue. They sharper their tongues like swords and aim their words like deadly arrows. That's Psalm 64. It was uh, um, Reese that told me, he said, Pastor, years ago you told me that the tongue is the only instrument in the, that gets sharper the more you use it. And it's true. The more you use your tongue, the sharper it gets. Amen. And some people are good with it. They make a living tearing people down. Amen. Just could tear you up with a tongue. Be responsible for what you say. Matthew 12, 36 says, But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. We understand this. There are times, guys, you just got to keep your mouth. Come on, say it loud. Yes. Amen. You got to close it. Because it's going to give you a way. And from inside of here, you're going to speak out. Maturity involves experiencing grace and truth in one's life. But it also includes living toward others with the same characteristics. People often excel at either being gracious or truthful. You'll, you'll see that to, in, in people's lives. You're either, you're either, here's another thing we call it, prophetic. You need a coat? Somebody need a coat? Surely. You need a coat? There's my coat. If you need it, if you need it. Okay. But stay with me. Uh, we use a term a lot in, in, in uh, prophetic. Somebody's got a prophetic unction, a prophet. When you study the Bible, you'll see that prophets were men that were black and white. They, they would see things and they would improve. That's why Isaiah was sawed in half for rebuking uh, uh, King Hezekiah for, for uh, a relationship with a woman who's not his wife. You know, he laid into him. Next thing you know, he sawed in half. Well, John the Baptist was a prophetic unction. You know, he was clearing the way of the Lord. So they, they have that black and white, that, that truth was about them. But the Bible's about grace and truth. Learning how to use grace and truth. Grace and truth. It's a, it's, it's a hard balance to work in your life, but it, I think it's very important. Grace only people, and the gracious person tends to be the accepting, quick to forgive, ready to reconcile with others. They want to make things right. However, if truth is not in play as well, the grace only person will be inclined to push it under the carpet, leave room to keep it bottled up inside, or pretend that injustice never happened. Let me ask you this question. How many of you feel like that you are probably a grace person? Wait a minute, you're grace. You're about grace. Amen. Yeah, okay, you ain't got to answer. I know who you are anyway. <laughs> Amen. So, so grace, grace is, I'm a grace person. Uh, I've been a merciful man my whole life. That's why mercy, mercy is its own reward. If you, if you give mercy, you get mercy back. You got to understand that out of the Beatitudes. Blessed is the man who's merciful for he shall obtain mercy. So he comes back to him. I've been that man for 30-something years. I've been merciful to people. I, I, I work in that. That's why I do get frustrated when mercy don't come back. Boy, it bothers me because I've always had this idea uh, of being kind toward people because if you've been forgiven much, you love much. And I've been forgiven much. My, when I got born again, I, I mean, it was the most fascinating thing to me that God could love a man like me. That, that coming through the lifestyle of the bootlegging and, and all the alcohol and the drugs and things of that nature. And it's not, it's not, I'm not trying to glorify testimony. I'm just saying from the time I was a young boy until I got born again, I did things I was ashamed of. And I didn't, I really, did, you know, some of my friends might have known some of it, but we didn't share about it. And when I got born again, I felt clean, clean. And my tongue got clean. The language I used to lose, use, it left me. Control was coming over me. I, was, I found myself wanting, not, watch it, not wanting to disappoint him. 
That's why I say great love toward God equals strong resistance toward sin. The more I love God, and so I get around religious people, and, and it bothered me because they were just religious. They were just somebody who went to church, but they didn't understand being born again when a life changes, when everything inside you shifts, and, and, and people look at you even different because they see a change in your life. And, and the thing is, after serving God for over 30-something years, that same fire just keeps trying to kindle back up in me. H, I just I remember where I came from. I don't want to go back to that. I I, I love my life. I, I used to tell people, man, if you could have had a sinful life that you enjoyed, you'd have been, it would have been mine. Because I, ha I had a good sinful life. It was fun. I mean, racing cars, hanging out with great friends. Uh, uh, <clears throat> had a good life, man, good life. And then when I got born again, it just got better. I, I mean, it, did, it wasn't something that shifted and changed to me. Where, oh, man, you're born. I have had a great time in life. Amen. And, and my life just keeps getting that way. So when, when I look at this, I'm, grace has been a big part of me. I love the grace of God. He's been good to me like that. But you can't separate the truth in, in the Word of God. There's a scripture in Psalms. I don't know exactly where it is, but it says grace and truth have kissed. And it's amazing how grace and truth work together. So hold on, guys. Okay. It's a piece of metal in my head from, from an accident years ago. Uh, Grace-only people will dismiss the problem instead of addressing it. Practically, this is the person who always makes excuses and refuses responsibility either for themselves or others. Second chances become a crutch. When a mother is a grace-only person, the kids get away with everything. When a father is the truth-only person, he'll beat them kids for everything. You follow me? Amen. That, that's why a good marriage has got to have grace and truth in it. It's got, it's got to work that. Now, truth only people, the truth only person tends to be ethical and upfront when it comes to others. They want to make things right as well. Yet, if grace is not in play, the truth only person will focus on the issues to the extent they view people as problems. Truth only people will hold ugly grudges, set unrealistic expectations, and often forget their own faults and their witch hunt. Let me tell you, if I was a pastor who was a truth only person, listen to this definition. Hold ugly grudges, set unrealistic expectations, often forget their own faults in their witch hunt, self-righteous. They're often too forceful and inflammatory to fix the problems. Practically, this looks like someone who's impossible to please and hard to get along with. I do know men who pastor with that uh, motivational gift. <laughs> Can I call that a gift? I would call that a curse, but they, you can't please them. You can't make them happy. They're, they're running everybody else down. They're, they're right, you're wrong. Even they never see their own error. Uh, they are dogmatic and have to win every argument. Their critical eye will never cut any slack. You try to talk with them, whatever you got, they got better. It's like a, I guess, can I say this in church? A peeing contest. Thank you, I get it. Okay. That's what it's like. You know, why do you want to do that? Ladies, I don't know if you understand that. I think you do. <laughs> but I, I don't like, I, you know, I, I passed that, that mark of maturity a long time ago. I don't have to defend my, my reputation and character with everybody that I meet. It just, it, it, that's probably one reason I don't hang out with preachers much anymore. I don't like most of them. <laughs> but grace and truth is so important. The goal is to become people of both grace and truth. See, I, do, I was truth there. I was very truthful, and I'm trying to be more graceful. Amen. But we must season our grace with truth and soak our truth in grace. And then, and only then, will we be able and have a healthy and joyful interaction. And we'll reflect God's character. And by the way, I know I shared this Sunday, but it's worth sharing with you again. You need to hear this over and over. Amen. For God wants us to be men and women of grace and truth. Colossians 4, 8 says, let your conversation be always full of grace. Seasoned with salt. Salt is truth. So that you may know how to answer everyone. Again, this is a process of becoming like Christ. When David shared about the rock where Jesus uh, uh, was asked to turn the, Satan asked him to turn the stone into bread. The issue there is shortcut and process. God is a God of process. He wants us to learn line upon line, precept upon precept, from glory to glory. That's how we move through life. Now, absolutely, at times, he will accelerate favor in your life. But the bottom line is, is it's about process. Amen. And learning. And you don't get grace and truth in the sixth grade. You learn it through life. Amen. Amen. You learn. You know, I, I hear people say this stuff right here. I hear parents say, tell the child, if you ever do this, I'll this. I've heard parents do that. If you ever divorce, you're not welcome back in this house. If, if, you, ever, if you ever do this, you're not welcome back in this house. And we'll say stuff like that. And we'll, we mean well by it. But the truth is, there's no truth in it. There's no grace in it. And so when the child stumbles or f uh, fumbles, 
they feel like they don't belong back in the house. I have found also this, that your kids will affect your theology. It's important to know your theology. Well, what do you believe about God? I'm, I'm a blood plus nothing person. You know that. It's the blood plus nothing. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not any works of our own. So I'm careful what I say to my kids because I don't want them to ever think any time in their life I will disown them. But I, and I've been wise enough to do that in life because I've watched pastors and men and women of God make mistakes by saying things to their kids when they were young and their kids couldn't live up to the expectation of the parents. And then the kids get shoved out. They don't feel like they belong. I hope that's good teaching to you. Okay. James chapter 3, guys. We're there. James says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. You notice there that James didn't even bring women into that. He just left them out <laughs> because he knew they couldn't get there. So he just brought men in. I'm just checking, just checking, make sure y'all are with me. Uh, when, when we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also... Uh, is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Let, let me stop here just a minute. This is James writing this. This is over 2,000 years ago. He's writing it to first-generation believers. And he's saying that even during this time that all animals have been tamed by men. He's saying horses have already been tamed. That we can tame the sea. We can tame this. We can tame that. But we ain't been able. And, and I look into James's life. And I got to see what Pastor James is seeing. Because he's dealing with a congregation of people. Again, being first generation. Some of them have come out of that, the temple. You know, we've talked about that. Or the temple with prostitution and things. The sailors have been there in the, in the city of Ephesus. You know, the, the, the tongue is a. Uh, you've heard people say, curse like a sailor. You know, so he's heard this language, and he's heard people talking, and, and so he's writing, he's telling us, guys, and so as, as relevant as this was 2,000 two years ago, how many know it seems more relevant today? Yes, I mean, we still had not figured this thing out. And he said, no man, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed. And have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. With it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James is challenging people here with this word. And he's saying this, this uh, praising God one minute and cursing the next, this shouldn't be. This kind of action and gossip and criticism, these things, this shouldn't happen. Why was he saying that? Because it was. It was. People were worshiping on one day and, 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 and being a, a horrible the next. And James is trying to put this parallel out there, and he's saying, this shouldn't be this way. Life shouldn't, you should have more God in you. As a matter of fact, he said, how are you saying that to another brother who's got, that God created him? You're tearing down one of God's creatures? You're speaking against him? Don't you know that God created that man? That woman? Quit tearing them down. So James is laying down a heavy word here. Now, he, three things here I want you to see here in verses 3 and 4. The tongue has the power to direct, like a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder on a ship. Mom, Dad, you have the ability to, to direct your children with your tongue. We have the, I have the ability to direct this church with my tongue. We have the ability to direct, if you're, if you're an employer, you have the ability to, to affect people with your tongue. Learning how to speak is a very important part of all of our lives and saying things properly. He said you can direct them like a rudder in a ship or a bit in a horse's mouth. And I can tell you, as, as somebody that's done my fair share of, of horse riding, uh, you know, I've, I've put a bridle on a horse and I've rode them with halters. And I'm gonna a bit is a whole lot easier to move a horse. And they may fight it and kick against it. We'll get that fixed eventually. I'll go have surgery. <laughs> but it's important to understand that you, you can direct. 
You can direct things. Learn how to say it. Learn how to say it. You know, I look at this young couples in this church. They're coming up with their children. Amen. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be fascinated watching you how, you, how you deal with your kids. Because, you know, our love for them is so strong, it's hard to say anything negative against them. But then there comes a time we've got to direct them. We've got to give them some, some instruction. Even I took my little hand and hit my little grandson on his little backside for, for just a little moment to remind him, Papa, we'll whoop your butt, boy. <laughs> he responded with all kindness, running to his mother yelling, no. <laughs> He's funny. My grandson's funny. He, isn't, he, isn't he? He's just cool. He, he told my daughter, that he was going to do something. And she said, I, I said no. And he said, Papa said. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> he uses me just like that. Verses 5 through 7. The tongue has the power to destroy. Fire. Tongue out of control. Can destroy a marriage, a ministry, children, reputation. It's full of deadly poison. Don't be that tongue. That I, I watch the news. I, I, uh, I'm a, a pastor's pastor when it comes to watching pastors and helping them and walking them through things. I, I love what I do. But I have found that the tongue is a, is a deadly poison. Just because you know a truth doesn't mean it needs to be said. Just because you know something on somebody doesn't mean it needs to be said. Amen. And I, I don't know where we get this unction that we think we're God's prophets to go out and share stuff with people about other people look somebody invited you into their life and they let you see who they are and now you're going to go out and hurt them with what you know shame on you amen, amen. Th they gave you opportunity to connect with them so connect with them be careful with your tongue well, you know I will die again with secrets of people that I have buried who have shared with me stuff that they did not want to. But some of their, their spouses will never know what I knew about these men. I let them die with their secrets. Amen. And I will die with their secrets. Just because you know stuff doesn't mean. You now, if it's something that's going to harm, you, you're wise. You're wise enough to deal with that. But some people are salacious when it comes to gossip. They got to know stuff. They got to hear. It. And it doesn't have to come out of here. It can be emailed, text, put out. And by the way, I just did. I found something cool on my smartphone. It's called delayed text. It's on your phone if you look for it. In other words, I can write a text and hit send, and it'll, it's a, it's a, it'll be a gray color, and it gives me so many seconds to put my thumb back on it and delete it before I send it. <laughs> now, that's a smart phone. <laughs> Some of y'all need to find that on your phone. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Brother Hicks, it ain't on your flip phone, okay? But I mean... <laughs> Be careful, be careful with your tongue. Some of you don't even realize the power you got with your tongue. The more influence you've got in life, the more power you have to, to affect people. It, it's a fire. Don't let that thing get out of control. And then it has the power to delight, uh, verses 11 through 12. Like a fountain and a fig tree. There's nothing more fitting than a, than a, than a good word. Hearing, uh, let me tell you something. Sometimes I'll hear uh, words in song. And it just builds me up. I, I said to the North Campus, I don't know if I said to you guys, but when I'm, I found that when I'm sad, when things have affected me in life, I hear the lyrics in a song. When I'm happy, I hear the melody and the music. That's why us from the 70s, none of us know any of the songs we sang. Have you noticed that? Us from the 70s, we lo I love my 70s songs. You know, Blinded by the Light, but that's all I know of that song. You know? Uh, she came down Yellow Mountain, and that's all I know of that song. Uh, you know, uh, I, I love Meatloaf. I love Bachman Turner Overdrive. I love Skinner. And, and, I, and it hit me the other day. I was trying to sing along, and one of the kids said, what are they saying there? I don't know. <laughs> I ain't got no idea what, the, what, the, what they say. Because when we were young, everything was fun. It was a lot of fun. But the older I've gotten, the more I hear the lyrics. I can hear, I can hear a gospel song uh, come to church and tear up. You know, I mean, just, it just hits me, you know, because it's according to where you're at in life. I wonder how James would feel if he knew how much we've conquered. We've put man on the moon. We've put him camping in outer space for months. We send men to the bottom of the sea. We bounce our words off satellites around the world. 
just this week, they, they think they've discovered water on Mars, and they think there could be life on Mars. God forbid we ever get to Mars and screw it up too. Amen. If there's life on other planets, and I'm sure that he must know, and he's been there once already, and he's died to save their soul, just leave them alone. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, they ain't trying to find us. Let's leave them alone. But we've, we've done all this crazy stuff, and yet we still haven't conquered the tongue. We can do so much, but we can't conquer the tongue. Well, and I like what you said, sis, about humor. We'll get to that in a minute. Some more ways, and we'll close with this. Witnessing, teaching, comforting. What's the tongue good for? Witnessing, teaching, comforting. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of the righteous is the fountain of life. Proverbs 10, 20, the tongue of the righteous is his choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of understanding. Proverbs eleven thirty. 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is Come on. If you win people to Jesus, you're wise, man. It takes wise men and women to lead people to Christ. You got to be wise. Jesus said, wise as a serpent and, and harmless as a dove. He, learn how to win people. People call me all the time. Pastor, I wish you go pray for so-and-so. They're going to hell, and I know you can reach them. And I ask myself, you've been with me for 10 years, and you ain't learned how to win somebody to Jesus yet? You pray for them. Quit sending me all over Timbuktu. It will be your joy if you get to pray for them, connect with them. Amen. It's an amazing death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your tongue has death in it and also has life. Learn how to give life. How can one accurately measure the benefits gleaned from a teacher well-versed in the Bible? Many of us come up here in the gospel, amen, and it's made us who we are today. It challenged our lives. It affected us. And I hear people say, well, you know, I've been, I've been with Pastor now for, for 10, 12, 15 years, and I can't remember what he preached a month ago. No, you may not remember. But I'll tell you something else. You may not remember what your wife cooked you a month ago either. Or what your mama fixed you two weeks ago. But you're still healthy in here. Amen. 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 Same way with the gospel. It, it affects our lives. It, it helps us that week. It gets us through. It gives us, it, it nurtures us. Amen. Or, or can we gauge the depth of comfort we receive from the lips of a close friend during a period of grief or affliction? And, and what about the one who told you about Jesus? Think about it. The gospel is believed only when words have communicated them. Our tongues can serve no better function in life than that of faithfully, consistently communicating Christ, sharing with them. I love leading people to Jesus. I'm not trying to put it off. I'm telling you, enter into the joy with me. There's nothing like winning somebody to Jesus. And here's the thing. You're not called to clean them up. You're a fisherman, not a cleaner of fish. You do the fishing. God will do the cleaning. Many of us, we got our mindset because all we think about is if I win my, my, my alcoholic, drug abusing brother-in-law to Jesus, now I got to deal with this. Or if I, if, I, if I lead my sister to Jesus with all her gossip and stuff, she might show up in this church. <laughs> Come on, I know y'all. So, so we do this kind of thing and we got, we're trying to figure out, don't worry about any of that. First, just lead them to Jesus, let him take care of them. Let him clean them up. He'll send them in the right church. He'll put them in the right place. It may not be here. It could be out there. Who knows where it could be? But, but the bottom line is you got to first make that first step. I, I, enjoy, I have enjoyed. I go back in my mind quite often, and I, and I repeat people who I remember. And I'm not, not talking about in church. I'm not talking about on Sunday morning altar call. I'm talking about being somewhere with a shotgun and witnessing to somebody about Jesus and they giving their life to Christ. I'm talking about when I was in Bible college and working for a security company with a shotgun in a back alley, winning the guys who were on the crew with me to Jesus. I'm talking about being on a school bus and driving it for two years and winning students to Jesus on a school bus. I, I, I go back in my life and I look back. My life has been a series of winning people to Jesus. Yeah, and I, I, I love that. As a youth pastor, uh, Joseph, my greatest joy was winning these kids. I chased them all over Channel View for years, man. I, I, would, I would hunt them down, hunt them down. I would show up at their beer bashes to win them to Jesus. And, man, I never condemned them. I just showed up. <laughs> They're in their tub full of beer, whiskey. And, they, and I'd knock on the door because I knew what they were doing. The football players, Channel View High School, when I was in Channel View. And I'd knock on the door, and they'd look at me. And this one guy, he said, oh, hey, who's at the door? And one guy said, hey, it's my pastor. Let him in. And they'd bring me in the middle of the party. And I would pray over the guys and 
Share Jesus with them. Didn't stay long. Overkill, get you in trouble. You know, <laughs> walk out. I just want to know I care. This is, this is the greatest thing you can do with your tongue is to win somebody to Jesus. Amen. Whether it be at work. And many of you have those testimonies, but you, we need more of it. We need to really be. Evangelism should just be a part of our life. It shouldn't be a special meeting we have. And there you are, it should be just something we do. It's just something we look forward to. And watch the moments take place. Not everybody you meet, you're going to share Christ with them. But then God will set you up. And you'll have that opportunity. And look at the launching pad you've got to use here. This church, your testimony, of things God's done in your life, you get a chance to share that. And it's easy, man. It's easy. It's not so hard to share Jesus with people. I, I just look back where I came from. You know, I, when I met H, were you born again when I met you? Barely. But I met Dee before I met you, and she told me that you bought whiskey from my grandma in Alabama, and that, so all of a sudden that was a connection. It's easy to connect like that. You never know how you connect with people, and everybody in here, you've got something in your life that, well, you know, it, it, could, be, it could be music, singing, and sharing, the, you know, when you're with somebody, it could be furniture, golf. You know, I can't tell you how many times on the golf course I've prayed with people back in the day. It's not a hard thing. And, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you about golf real quick. Everybody has a bad game every now and then. If you're playing good, that gives you the up, and you can pray for them. <laughs> Help them out. Amen. Let me move on here and close. A good sense of humor. Oh, that's what I love about a good tongue, a good sense of humor. Proverbs 15, 13, happy, happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. Proverbs 15, 15, all the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. Humor to me is just, it, it's, it's my fuel. I love to laugh. Now, not all jokes are dirty. Hello. I love a good, clean comedian. I love somebody that can share. You know, I come up in the Hee Haw generation. I remember Red Skelton. I, I love the Three Stooges, you know, uh, slapstick, humor, just humor. I love humor. My dad, that was one of the things, you know, since he's had a stroke, that one of the things that my mom and I have talked about that we put on certain things in front of him where he, he can laugh some. Laughter doth good like a medicine. If you can learn to laugh, you can heal yourself, man. You've got to keep laughing. Again, when, when, there's, when there's heartache, it crushes the bones. But if you can get to smiling again, if you can get your laughter back, if you can get your joy back in here, my friend, and that's the thing we prayed for when I walked out with the band. You know, we've been doing this now for 12 years together, praying before we come out here and doing, you know, we do this four times a week. But the bottom line is, can we keep our joy? Because we do this so much, you know, it's a repetition. Can we keep our joy? That's the big thing in life, to keep your joy. Humor is well-chosen, properly timed expressions of wit and amusing, funny statements. Did you know some people can't tell a joke? Isn't that funny? <laughs> it is. I mean... I love humor. I have a comedy tape somewhere called A Spoonful of Sugar. Some of you may remember that. It wasn't meant to be a comedy tape. I was trying to be serious. But it ended up, some of you, it's on cassette if I remember right. That's how old it is. But actually, it turned out that people laughed so much on that tape. I, did it, I was preaching for Pastor Rick, and uh, they laughed so much. And they have no idea the hurt I was going through at the time I was dealing with it. They have no idea. You know, there's nothing sadder than the tears of a clown. But there are times that through preaching, I get my victory back. And even when you're going through tough times, finally, I find out what it is you do. I don't care if it's singing a song, sharing the word, reading the Bible. But, but if you can keep your humor, you're going to make it through this life. God gave you the ability. He gave you all kind of bones in your body, but my favorite bone is not so much the backbone or the jawbone, but it's the funny bone. I love the funny bone. I love, I love good humor, man. I can't get enough of it. Every now and then in this church, and God for help us. We were out with some friends last week. Sister Lori and I were celebrating our anniversary. And somehow I heard her in the back seat talking to Becky about a situation that happened years ago. In New Caney, when we first started the church, the little country church there. And I was asking for a fan. We needed to put a fan out in the foyer. You remember that? We need to put a fan out in the foyer. And I said, we need to put a big fan out in the foyer. And I said, and some horns, some long horns. You know, it'd be good. How many of y'all were there that day? You remember that? Okay, y'all do, do. This man, a crane fell on him, fell on his head. That's kind of tough. He's in a wheelchair. 
He's a good guy, but every now and then he'd just speak his mind and forget where he was. And he's right up in front of the church. And I remember I said, we need some horns. And he starts going, whoo, whoo, whoo. And I'm looking at him for me to Robert. He goes, whoo, whoo, whoo. He's, he threw his hand up. He said, Pastor, I got some. And I said, no, they, they have to be big. He said, no, Pastor, these are some big-ass horns. <laughs> You remember that? This is church life for us. This kind of stuff happens to us all the time. And the neat thing is we didn't take offense with it. We didn't get all, all smug or self-righteous. I actually repeated what he said. Did you just say? And I said it, you know, so everybody else in the church could know what was said. But this is been, humor can come out. At, you don't know when it's going to hit, man. But when it comes, enjoy the humor. Your kids will say the coolest stuff sometimes if you listen to them. Your grandkids, I love humor. Don't be afraid to laugh. Would you stand with me? There are special times when a sense of humor is needed. You know, a lengthy, tense, heated meeting, or when the atmosphere has settled in the home over a long period of time or following extremely difficult experiences in life. There's a need for humor. There's a need to kind of have that breakthrough. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed uh, with Jill. Jill is one of the most humorous, you know, she's my 17-year-old. And she is so funny, witty, funny, smart aleck, on the edge, almost getting a whooping. <laughs> but she's right there. She just, her little quirks, she's just quirky. And then Judah will get with her, and it's just, it's just laughter. We laugh. It's just funny. You can't help yourself. I love being around, and I thank God for kids with a sense of humor that can learn to laugh. And I, I thank God for a church that's learned to laugh. When I'm moving through the pictures of, uh, was it a week ago, when I put, had you put the obituaries of people and funerals I've preached, which has been now in the hundreds. There was over 70 pictures on there. I looked through there, and I'll be honest with you. Some of them people made me laugh when I saw their picture. I miss them. I miss Ken Holly. When I'm thinking, why did I miss Ken Holly? Oh, because I'd be preaching, and he'd be clipping his nails. I'd have to ask him after church, Ken, did you hear what I, I said? Oh, yeah, I heard everything you said. You weren't listening to a word I said. I wanted to reach over and hit him. And then I got, you know, and then I did his funeral. And then, well, while I was doing his funeral, the only thing I was thought about doing, seriously. <laughs> just right in front of his coffin, you know, just standing right there, clip my nails just to get him back. I was flip through there, and I'm seeing these people that made me laugh. Not, you know, I missed them. I think you've got to learn how to laugh in life. Hallelujah. Well, I want to close with a few more scriptures here. I think it's important. James 3, again, verse 1 says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault with what he says, he's perfect, able to keep his whole body in check. I meet people a lot that want to be preachers. They want to be teachers. They want to be up front. Let me give you this warning again. Don't presume to be a teacher because you're going to be judged more strictly than anybody else. If I lead you to stray, you know what God's going to do with me. So I remind myself, don't be one of these shepherds that would do something. Make sure that you, you're not deceived. You understand the Word of God. You study it out. Don't lead people astray. The second verse we'll close with is in Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth, amen. When they come out, may they be acceptable to him, amen. amen. Father, I thank you for church tonight. I thank you for an opportunity to share your word. Lord, let joy ring in this house, let humor. Let us be people that understand how to encourage one another with our words. Lord, I thank you for the word of God and how it challenges us and changes us. I give you praise for this night, Lord. And I also pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to get control of ourselves and remind us, give us a direct word. Share with us how to reach other people. And I give you praise for this church and, and Lord, what you're doing here and in New Caney. Bless the little country church, God. And we thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go get your children.